Hello, everyone. It's so good to be back. I'm Sandy Rosenthal, host of Beat the Big Guys, and I have a guest today that I'm so excited about. I'm so excited I actually bought her book and read the whole thing. Um, today, we're going to be with Nina Tayshultz. Did I say that right? I did. Nina, yes, Nina, Nina Tayshultz, a science journalist who was author of the New York Times bestseller, The Big Fat Surprise. This book turns on its head that conventional wisdom that we all heard about on dietary fat and especially saturated fat and started a new conversation about whether or not these fat do in fact cause heart disease. Named best book of the year by The Economist, Wall Street Journal and Mother Jones among others, it continues to be called a must read for anyone seeking to understand the story of how we came to believe that fat is bad for your health and what a better diet might look like. Ms. Tay Schultz is also founder of the Nutrition Coalition, a nonprofit working to ensure that government nutrition policy is transparent and evidence based, something it hasn't been before work for which she's been asked to testify before the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Canadian Senate. Welcome, Nina. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. You're so welcome. And um, before we start on this very, very important topic, uh, I wanted to share something. I understand that you grew up in Berkeley. Well, That's this true. past Labor Day, I spent with my niece in Berkeley. Oh, wow. And what a beautiful area you grew up in. It's now technically she lives in Oakland, but she's one block from Berkeley. And it certainly felt like Berkeley when I was there. Uh, do you get back there much? I do because my, I, it's, you know, Berkeley, California, many of you know, is sort of the, the really the birthplace of the sort of the 1960s hippie movement and feminist movement is a lot of it was born there. So I grew up there. Um, my parents still live there. My sister, her family, my brother, his family, everybody still lives there. So I go back several times a year and, um, and I love it there. And I think it hasn't really changed all that much. I mean, the university is still the same and there's, you know, about a month ago, there would have been everybody walking all the streets to, 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 for, um, rush week for fraternities and sororities and, <laughs> and, you know, still as a, I, maybe one of the things that's grown up most still is very strong. There is the local food movement with Alice Waters and Chez Panisse. And we used to spend my, my birthdays going to Chez Panisse restaurant, which was actually, we could walk there from my house. So, um, yeah, so I grew up, surrounded by um, hippies and <laughs> a lot of interest in food. Well, I, I'm, I'm jealous. Um, I actually visit my niece, uh, my daughter, excuse me, my daughter in San Francisco, which is freezing cold and cloudy and misty and windy. And then we drive just 30, maybe 35 minutes and we're in beautiful Berkeley. Um, or Oakland. It's just, it's amazing the difference in the, in the climate in those two places so close together. Um, so That's anyway, true. but we had a little connection there that I thought it would, might be fun to share, but yeah. on to the important work of something that we've all had the wool pulled over our eyes for decades. Um, it's, it's um, after reading your book, which was a page turner, it, it's obvious to me from the book that there's overwhelming evidence that eating fewer carbohydrates um, can help reduce heart disease and, but, and, and also obesity and diabetes. But, but Nina, how did we get to this point where we were all believing what obviously the wrong thing? How did we get here? Well, it is a, it is a big story and it's why it took me um, almost a decade to write my book because I read, um, you know, maybe 10,000 nutrition studies. I had to learn how to read them. I interviewed hundreds of nutrition experts um, and, and people in industry and, and ac academia all over the world. And I really had to convince myself um, that this thing that seemed so impossible could actually be true. Because when I started out, I was really like most people. I was um, 
a mostly vegetarian. I did not eat red meat. I did not eat, hadn't eaten red meat or butter for 25 years at least. And I, you know, I tried to focus mainly on plant foods as I had been told. I made my own bread. I um, cooked my, you know, pasta. I made my own pizza. I mean, all these things that I had tried to do, I avoided fat. I would you know, have salad. I don't know if people do this anymore, even, but you know, salads only with vinegar on them, trying to avoid fat as much as possible. And all of, um, from my, you know, from about 16 onwards, I was overweight. And then I increasingly suffered from like terrible sinus infections with tons of antibiotics. And I had surgery. And so I wasn't healthy, you know, and I went to spas and I tried to get healthy and they said, you need to reduce your saturated fat even more and bring down your fat and definitely don't eat meat. And so that I was a complete believer in all of that. And I was, I think like most Americans thinking like, well, I'm not losing weight. And I, you know, my, all my, and, cholesterol and they're telling you, and they're telling you to eat more broccoli, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, eat more <laughs> broccoli, eat more salads, eat more vegetables, eat more fruit. And I was doing all that right. and I wasn't getting any healthier, but you know, and I was exercising like a maniac, but you still think like, well, your doctors can't be wrong. And so it must be something about you because then once you're overweight, you have, you know, it, it hurts your, you know, your self-esteem is, injured in a way. So it's hard to, it's hard to think, it's hard to imagine that all these people could be wrong. So, um, so I really, that's, that was my mindset entering into this, into the early, in the early 2000s, when um, I was a journalist, I was doing a series of articles for Gourmet Magazine, and they assigned me a story on trans fats, which now people probably have forgotten about and um, but trans fats are sort of hardened vegetable oils like they they, they occur in, in margarine and and you have trans fats and frying oils and anyway i had never heard of them i didn't know anything about fat but that story investigating that story started me along this this really long path of being obsessed about nutrition which i still am um, because i started calling up nutrition scientists and asking them about fats and hearing stories like from a woman who had been researching trans fats long before it was fashionable to think they were bad for health. And she had been harassed by the margarine companies who had executives had visited her offices and tried to yank papers out of journals and tried to prevent her from publishing and and publishing nasty, mean things about her. And then I and then in 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 peer reviewed journals. And then I learned about the group of men who said that they had been assigned to stand up at conferences and, and basically heckle or harass any scientists who had come out with um, contrary findings against trans fats. So what opened about up, what year was this approximately it was like people in the in the late 70s and okay. in the 80s, I found, you know, when I talked to them, they had all retired because you, because if they were still in science, they would never have told me these things. Um, but it was it was just clear to me that this world of nutrition science that we that tells us so many contradictory things and, and we so, trusted we, and we trusted. trusted even while it's contradicting itself and going back and forth and, but we trust it but what i realized was that the interest of the food and the pharmaceutical industries was so enormous and that that they paid off scientists that they were interfering in the science that they were sending people to heckle scientists at conferences, that it was, it was far from the calm, rational, reasonable, data-driven world of science that I had imagined, right? I mean, growing up, my father was an engineer and ran a center at Stanford University. And I, you know, we talked about science at the dinner table and it was nothing like the world of nutrition science that I discovered. So what did I discover? Funny. You know, what was the course of the 10 years of, of research or almost 10 years in writing this book? Well, first of all, I zeroed in on this subject of dietary fat because I had been assigned the story about trans fats, but also because what do we as women, you know, of, of a certain generation, what do we grow up? What did we grow up absolutely obsessing about? Like, how much fat should I eat? What are the good fat, bad fat, non-fat? Should I put salad dressing on? You know, what kind of fat should I 
cook with. So this had been like one of the central obsessions of for for many, especially women, because you know women tend to be what we call adherers in science. Like we follow the rules. We really try hard because we care about our appearance. We want to be healthy and our children. Maybe more than mm-hmm. do, right. So. Right. Um, so I really studied the subject of dietary fat, and I and I would say that my research really led to several main findings. Um, one of them was this that this idea that eating fat made you fat, like that the bacon you ate for breakfast would you know go straight to your hips, or you know that it would make you fat or give you heart disease, was completely was completely inaccurate. Um, right. That fat does not, the fat you eat is, does not make you fat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that we had been taught this because fat is more, it's more, it has more calories per gram, right? There's, there's about nine calories per gram of fat compared to the other two macronutrients, which are protein and carbohydrate that you eat. All foods are made up of fat, protein, and carbohydrate. Fat is the most calorically dense. And so scientists in the 1960s, they said, well, if it's got a lot of calories, we should just cut it back because it'll help people cut back on calories. But that proved out to to be just like this, it was a wild, it was just an idea. It had no evidence behind it. And it turned out to be a mistake because fat, fat plus protein, so like dairy, eggs, <laughs> meat, all the things that we avoided because they thought they were bad for us or they would make us fat. Those fat plus protein turns out to be the most satiating foods. So they fill you up mm-hmm. and you are satisfied after eating a meal of those. And then, and then you are no longer hungry compared to carbohydrates, which is like cookies, crackers, you know, popcorn, um, basically everything in the central aisles of supermarkets, you eat carbohydrates. So potatoes, whatever it is, that's, you know, fruit is high in carbohydrates, high in sugar. Just think of things that are sugars and starches. Those foods spike your blood sugar, right? Even if you eat an apple, which you you think like, I used to eat tons of fruit thinking like, what could be healthier? But it all spikes your blood sugar and your blood sugar goes up and then it crashes and then when it crashes that makes you hungry so you're so so anything that has a sugar in it which includes starches and sugar and fruits makes your blood sugar go up then it crashes and you have to eat some more and then it crashes and that starts you on this roller coaster of blood sugars that makes it drives your appetite it makes you want to eat more and then over time exposure to all that sugar is what will um it what drives obesity and diabetes. And a lot of those things, uh, for a lot of people, these spikes affect their moods and their temperament. Um, I I, I know that wasn't a subject of your book, but people would become angry when their their sugar would plummet. But yeah, all kinds of bad things happen. But yeah, go on. (laughs) Well, no, I mean, there's a really interesting and burgeoning field about blood sugar and mental health, which is that Mm -hmm. when they control people's blood sugars, I mean, so if you think about your blood sugar, let's say it's a, it's a a line on a, you can get a blood glucose monitor and watch it, you know, eat, eat, eat an apple and see it shoot up. If you're on protein and fat, your blood sugar is like this. So it's not going up and down. And what they find is that this flat line is what allows people to be much calmer. Hmm. It, they're not, it, it not just calmer, but you know, helps people get off antidepressants, helps people reverse out of a lot of um, different kinds of mental health issues and problems because they're not, they're not jacked up and down on sugar. In fact, I have a friend who ran an addiction clinic for drugs in um, South Africa. And she said, one of the most important things that she did for people on drug addicts was to help them get unaddicted to sugar because all of those addictions were feeding each other. But anyway, this is really beyond the scope of what I was studying, but it's really interesting to people what happens when they start getting off of sugars and starches that they are able there within just a matter of weeks. I mean, this is all now from experimental data, from really good clinical trial data. 
They're able to bring down their blood pressure in a matter of weeks. They're able to bring, to bring down their blood sugars to a point where they are in remission from diabetes in a matter of weeks. They're able to, some people um, lose a, a weight quite rapidly. I would say that's true for, for men more than women, but it, it, it does seem to be the most sustainable way to lose weight. And it's precisely because the fat and the protein are satiating. So well, that's very encouraging. Back. That's, that's is, encouraging to hear because it's not, it's not like all is lost. Uh, these things. Well, can I mean, be... I mean, anybody who's dieted, right. I mean, you know, any, I don't know about your audience, but like, I, I mean, ha, I, how many diets was I on? I was on a diet my entire life and, and diets fail because you get hungry. You start off with the best intentions. Mm -hmm. You are jogging, you're dieting, you're doing everything right. And then you're hungry and nobody can stay hungry forever. And so you fail. And then and you it, feel in addition, like during this time, I just, if I could just add this during this time you're describing, uh, I also recall this crazy fad of exercising so hard you'd almost kill yourself. And I'm talking about the, the aerobics, the high impact aerobics and women were going to these, these health clinics, I mean, the health spas and jumping up and down till they're almost dead and injuring themselves in the process because they thought it was good for them. And this was at the same time as right. this bad at um, health advice. Anyway, I was just, I'm just noticing how these two things are converging to yeah. destroy us all. <laughs> well, it's a little bit, you know, in the line of the theme of your podcast, which is such an interesting theme, which is that, um, as you can imagine, all the things that you and I have just been talking about are not popular amongst sort of um, the, you know, the, the, orthodoxies, the powers that be, the experts, because they're, we're talking about solutions that are free, right? A diet, <laughs> you know, we're not talking, we're not asking, the solutions we're talking about is not take the five following drugs to mm -hmm. cure your hypertension and be on insulin and take care of your, and your weight loss pill. We're just saying like, this is a, a, a solution that is available to everyone that is within their reach and does not require mm -hmm. dependence upon big pharma, and it rejects a lot of what big food has to offer, right? We're asking to say like, okay, you can forego the boxes of cereal and um, and the, and a lot of the stuff in the center aisles and, and instead have whole foods um, that are natural. And, and big food doesn't make those foods. You know, they make the cookies, crackers, and so they have huge margins on those foods. They don't have high margins on natural whole foods. So, we're talking about solutions that are um, that are, in some ways, democ you know, democratic solutions. Like everybody can participate, <laughs> but that doesn't benefit corporations. Um, and so there's a huge effort to try to like, to quiet the science, or to ignore the science, or to quiet voices or people who are talking about this science or these studies. Um, so, um, and, and just getting back to exercise, exercise is a narrative. The idea that you can best lose weight through exercise is I think also a narrative of corporations who would like you to think that what you need to do is to go and spend, you know, two hours a day, which is, a, I mean, the amount of time that it takes to go and exercise even an hour a day, which is what the government, US government used to recommend. It's, it's a huge commitment in your life. Mm -hmm. But what, what scientific studies show is that for weight loss, exercise is relatively ineffective that, you know, 80%, 90% of weight loss is about what you eat. Mm -hmm. I mean, my good friend lost two over 200 pounds. This is a common story, 200 pounds of weight loss without doing any exercise. It was all diet. It was taking out the sugars and the starches, eating more fat and protein. And then when you get down to your last 20, 20 pounds to lose, you can start lifting weights or you know doing the kind of exercise that really makes a difference in terms of changing your, um, your kind of like your ability to be sensitive to, to hormone, um, hormones that drive hunger and, and fat storage. But really, Exercise is kind of a, a diversion from what are the real drivers of weight loss. I totally uh, agree. And, but I, I love I your point. To, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I, I just wanted to uh, point out, I love your point 
that this is democratic and that anyone can make their choice at any time on what they will and will not eat. And I had a bit of an epiphany listening to you thinking that's why so much money is spent on, uh, or perhaps that's why so much money is being spent by big food, big agriculture, and big pharma, but because we can decide. We can decide, we can decide overnight that we're gonna start eating differently. And so because a human being is so, uh, has so much power to control uh, what he or she eats and doesn't eat, and, and, and I think maybe that's part of this uh, problem that we're in, it is. And so what their strategies are is to promote false narratives about what is successful for weight loss. Um, so what are those false narratives? One of them is calories in, calories out. You need to count your calories and you need to, you need to, you need to be a slave to calories. Um, I used to be a slave to calories, Me but too. that is not you're right. I mean, I like I hardly know a woman my age who wasn't, but uh, or anybody my age. But that is a false narrative. You you can the it is. I mean, our grandparents didn't count calories, and many of them were effortlessly slim. They also didn't go to gyms because gyms didn't exist. So, it's not about calories. It's about keeping your carbohydrates low, your sugars low, your starches low, your fruit low eating fat and protein until you are satisfied. And then you learn another thing that is sort of in the line of being democratic. It allows you to trust your body. If you just eat mostly fats and healthy proteins, you are you can just trust your body. And when it is full, it is full and you can trust it. So you enter into this completely different relationship with wow. food where you're no longer hating food and and worrying about what you're going to eat you're just like i'm going to eat when i'm hungry and i'm going to stop when i'm full as long as i avoid the foods that make me fat and unhealthy i'm fine i love that it. is that, tremendous empowering. inspiration yeah it's it is it's empowering and liberating for people who have been spent their whole lives you know worrying about the calories worrying about whether or not they got to the gym um you know it's stressing tracking everything they eat writing it down and what a boring, I mean, I've lived it. So I know how boring and obsessive it is. Um, and a whole nother topic is um, the high incidences of anorexia, which I'm sure we didn't have that in the World War II era. I didn't know what the word anorexia was until I was, I think, uh, 35 years old, but that's a whole nother conversation, right? Well, but I mean, it's partly that what calorie counting does and obsessing about your food right. does is it drives you to have eating disorders yeah. because yeah. you're so worried about what you've consumed and you can't trust your body. So Ab if absolutely. you can trust your body, eat fat and protein, you no longer have to worry. Okay. And so now let's get to the topic that, that my book was actually really about is the okay. central argument was this idea that saturated fats are not bad for health. Okay. So we, we're taught there are two types of fats, good fats and bad fats. And we're taught exactly the reverse from what the science shows. We're taught that the good fats are vegetable oils, margarine, um, you know, you should be eating canola oil, soybean oil, and you should avoid um, butter or dairy or, you know, or red meat. What the scientific literature shows really quite, I mean, it's, it's almost really unequivocal at this point. It's become, the science has become actually much stronger since my book came out. It's now, I mean, it's, it's really indisputable is that saturated fats, the reason that you avoid perhaps meat, full fat dairy, you know, regular milk, butter, those fats do not cause heart disease. They have been tested more than really any other nutrient in the history of nutrition science. They've been tested on 75,000 people in randomized controlled clinical trials, which is the most rigorous kind of science you can possibly do. And in none of those experiments could they be shown to have any effect on cardiovascular um, mortality or total mortality, which is like your likelihood to die of, of heart disease or anything else. And, um, and they showed, you know, they showed no effect on, on heart attacks and on other cardiovascular events. So, I mean, this is really quite the, this is the big opposite of what we've been told. This is I mean, big. It really is. It is big. I will tell you that there are nearly now 
maybe there are now exactly 20 papers by top academics from all over the world, independent teams of scientists that have come out in the last decade, all re-examining this clinical trial data on 75,000 people, all saying, you know, we got it wrong on saturated fats. The data do not show that they are bad for health. And just to give a little historical explanation, what happened is that these clinical trials on these 75,000 people, they all took place in the 1960s and 70s, which was a period when the whole idea that saturated fats are bad for you, the whole hypothesis was kind of like, it was coming, it was, it was like it's in its heyday. It was, that was sort of when it was being adopted by the National Institutes of Health and everybody was embracing it. And, and these that was a yeah. time in our history when the entire U.S. House and Senate was men, um, middle-aged and older men who were having heart attacks. Right. So that's, I right. noticed that in chapter six. So, yeah, yeah. I re that's a very good point that I'm going to pick up on in just a second, okay. which is that they were all obsessed about what causes heart disease because they're middle-aged men. And in the 60s and 70s, that was mostly a disease of men, not women. Women, it didn't come really affect women until later. Mm -hmm. And cancer was starting to be one of the two killer diseases. Um, in the 60s and 70s, these were, they were, you know, they were still like on the rise. They were nowhere near where they are today. But they were obsessed about, you know, what can we do to prevent these diseases? They fixated on saturated fat and cholesterol so in the 60s and 70s, this is when all of this science is sort of being done and being explored. The National Institutes of Health is behind it. The American Heart Association is behind it. Everybody has decided saturated fats and cholesterol are bad for health. And this, it's just important to understand. This was not, this was an idea that was born in the 60s. They did the trials. The trials could not confirm the idea. And that's like a huge thing because you know, you expect a clinical trial, all these scientists, these male scientists thought the trials would confirm what they had already believed to be true, but they didn't. And what happened to the results of those trials is something I really explore in my book. And it's a fascinating story for science, which is that they were not published. They delayed publication. One was delayed publication for 17 years. One laid in a basement in National Institutes of Health, never published. Other studies were ignored. They're their, their findings were buried. Nobody talked about them. Nobody cited them. So these, these trials were basically kind of just stuffed. And that's why we don't know about them. And nobody really talked about them. And then finally, I think my book and then and the work of other um, really journalists and some scientists kind of brought them back to life. And that's why the last decade has seen this huge reconsideration of saturated fats, which unfortunately has not, you know, risen up to the level of our expert science, you know, our expert guidelines. Um, and that really leads us into the subject of, you know, why we can't get our, <laughs> our authorities to change, why they will not update their thinking, why it's so hard to go up against authorities that are so entrenched in their ideas. But that's the key really word, entrenched big and entrenched. entrenched big entrenched bureaucracies that just cannot change um but really the takeaway message is saturated fats do not cause harm mm -hmm. they are actually good for you in that they raise your good cholesterol and is one of the only foods on the planet known to raise your hdl that's your good cholesterol and they are present in many foods that have all the essential nutrients needed for life so as much as we hear that you know red meat is the most worst terrible thing you can eat it is the most it has the most nutrients it's the most dense in nutrients that you need for your health and we are currently experiencing especially among women an epidemic in um, iron deficiency it leads to anemia where's the best place to get iron in a bioavailable form it is red meat well, same with this is um, so and this is a very important conversation because not only are as our, our listeners hearing, you know, tools and advice on beating the, the big guys in their communities, but we're also getting some good advice on taking care of ourselves. Uh, so this is a, well, a right. double, <laughs> double, double good for our listeners. But I, I just gotta, I just gotta get it out that I, I feel that for a generation of kids to have been told to drink skim milk and either zero to no eggs a day, not one, zero or none a day, um, or zero or one. Um, 
reduce your meat, reduce your cheese, and, and childbearing women too, with no science to back it up. To me, it's unconscionable. It makes me angry. I had to say that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I think that the anger that people feel, especially when they've had, you know, what does it lead to when you're a childbearing woman, woman who doesn't have, I mean, I was in nutrition. It, it leads to children with all kinds of learning disabilities with um, there's, there's permanent neurological damage in children that have vitamin B12 deficiencies. Where do you get B12 in, in meat and dairy and in um, shellfish, which we were also told not to eat because of its cholesterol mm -hmm. content. A mercury Eggs, or something. Yolk, yeah. Bottom yolk dwellers. Of the egg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were told not to. We were told not to eat all the foods that contain the nutrients that we need to, for healthy life and reproduction. I mean, that's basically it. We're and we're still told that we're told to eat a plant-based diet, mm -hmm. where they, you know, plants contain nutrients, but the here's like the sort of the store understory that most people don't know plants contain nutrients that we cannot absorb as well so you cannot get you know omega-3s you think you're getting them you know from plant-based sources that's not in the form that you can absorb them you need to get them from fish you know you cannot get the iron that you get from spinach is not in a bioavailable form you have to have like 41 cups of spinach to maybe get as much as you can get in a few ounces of, of, you know, of red meat. You can't absorb the nutrients from plants as effectively. And it's also true that they have something called anti-nutrients. So like one of the ones that we all know about is gluten, mm -hmm. but there are other ones. Like if you eat a lot of kale, you're getting a something called oxalates, which is, you know, just look oxalate um, and phytates. They inhibit absorption of nutrients. So you're, you're getting a mixed bag. I mean, remember plants, Unlike animals, plants can't run away to avoid being eaten. So they develop, their system of defense is to develop a bunch of poisons so that animals won't eat them. I mean, when we've, we've read out a lot of the poisons in order to use them for human consumption, but they're by no means the best source of nutrients. Interesting. You know, like a, that's why persimmon tastes so bad <laughs> when, <laughs> well, before I mean, it's ripe. <laughs> like, you know, they're important phytonutrients or whatever, but I'm just saying like, you know, where do you, what do you get in an egg? It's all in the egg yolk, which we were told not to eat. You know, right. you get right. choline, which, mm -hmm. which is another shortage, which you, and lutein and um, another nutrient I'm forgetting, but you know, their nutrients are essential, essential for brain health, for eye health, uh, you need those new, I, we just don't think about it because we become so obsessed with just like avoiding the foods that might give us heart disease, but you need those foods to be healthy for your skin, to be healthy, for your hair, to be healthy, for your hair, not to fall out, you know, for not to go gray. You need them for your babies and for your children, your children need them to grow and to be strong. So we've really been dealt quite a bad deck of cards when it comes to nutrition and what we've been told to eat. And but thank goodness um, for your work. And, and I think it's fair to say uh, that your work may have been the first major eye opener. I, I know you weren't the first person to write about, um, about, about your findings, I, but, uh, or the only one, uh, but I do think that this book and presenting it clearly in a way that people could read, you didn't have to be a doctor uh, or a lawyer to yeah. read this and understand it. I, I really think you paved the way. Thank you. I appreciate that. So if we I mean, could, it is, I'm sorry, you no, wanted to add something. So if we, if no, we, I, no, I go ahead, please go ahead. The, um, I, there are two things that right in the beginning of, of, of your conversation that stood out to me. One is that you had to start out and convince yourself and you had, and mm -hmm. you read the data, which is so critical. I'm, I mean, reading and, and knowledge, I really believe that it's not who you know to succeed, it's what you know. And you read and you taught yourself and trained yourself. So when you reach that point, uh, I don't know if you had a eureka moment, it probably happened over a course of time where eventually you realize, oh my goodness, the science is backward or what we're being told is backward, okay? How did you give yourself the, the, um, the, the courage of your convictions to speak out? and do your work and write your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I would say that right up almost to the publication of my book, I had tremendous doubts and I kept thinking I must have missed something. Like, mm -hmm. how could I, how's it possible I could be right and so many people could be wrong and all the authorities could be wrong? I mean, it, it seems so. Um, like a character in a B weight movie yeah, where you're the right. only one with the truth and everyone else is wrong. <laughs> you just think. It seems like such, you know, chutzpah, like, and in such lack of modesty, and it is not. Um... So I did have to, like, I went over everything a million times, and I would lay down on the floor and just say, "I must be. How can I be right? I must be wrong." I mean, that happened. That used that would happen pretty much every night I was writing my book, and then I and and you know, finally it just got published, and I had to think, <laughs> well, and then my book was out for quite a long, you know, quite a while. And I listened to the arguments against it and I read the arguments against it. And I realized, you know, people were starting to criticize me in a kind of ad hominem way, but there was not really any substantive, there was no substantive critique of my book. That they couldn't I, that criticize I, your book, so I they couldn't. criticized you. They criticized me personally. You could say, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm certainly not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a PhD. But there was no substantive critique, you know, and, and people, at, right. you know, I know that I, I, I know they read my book at Harvard and at Yale and at, you know, Johns Hopkins. And I know that the, you know, the book really made the rounds and they could not come up with a substantive critique of my book. No serious person wrote a substantive critique of my book. And the few that like by internet bloggers, I, you know, I responded to because they were, they were just grasping at straws. And so I sort of like, I was able to like, you know, drive test my book. And I realized like, you know, I may have gotten tiny things wrong here and there, but the, the main essence of, of my findings was, was correct. And then since then, the science has only gotten stronger to sort of uphold my own findings um, because scientists read my book and they did their own work and, and, and found out for themselves and read the same papers that they didn't even know that existed because I had dug them out of files or, you know, you find them in, obscure journals and so top that's, level that's wonderful you know it really it's great i mean i'm actually on the point where i'm going to publish a series of papers with some of the top scientists in the whole field of nutrition where i'm co-author with them on papers that are going to come out and and will basically confirm you know much of what i've what i was writing about in my book Great. I have to get on your mailing list because I'm very interested in those. And my husband is too. So um, I did want to touch on something else that you talked about because our listeners wanted to take on their big guys, either in their neighborhood or their state, or even, even maybe, yes. uh, even maybe um, something as big as the AMA or the USDA. Um, so how did you handle when that harassment comes and it will always come right. whenever people are protecting right. uh, when uh, there's money involved, if there's a lot of money involved, the, right. the criticism will come. So what, what is your right. advice to our listeners for when it comes? Right. Um, so, all right. You might be able so to share a story I, or two. Yeah. So, you know, even before my book came out, I, there was a Huffington Post column by um, a doctor named David Katz, who at that point was at Yale, um, who wrote that, who wrote a, a nasty critique of me saying, I'm a nobody, saying, you know, who am I? I'm like just, I'm and crit criticizing my book. He went on to write maybe a dozen columns that included calling me like a parasite of science and the worst of you know the internet fanatics and i had i mean i've had so many doctors and other people come at me for being um you know for being uh for whatever they can they you know at, what did dr katz he was really the worst um and he what did he say he said um she she he said she's an animal unlike anything i've ever seen was what he told the a guardian reporter that's harsh and, yeah, I mean, to call people animals is what you do in in psychological warfare, right? To reduce people to the level, that's what they did, you know, to Jews in World War II. I mean, it's really, like, it was really psychological warfare. And um, so there's, so first of all, you have to study the psychological warfare and understand what the techniques are. 
Okay. And how do you do that? How, how do you find out what these techniques are? Yeah, you know, you have to really study like people who you have to read commun books on communication and understand what people are doing to you. So you, you recognize how people are attacking you, how they resort to ad hominem attacks, how they will send out because we now live in a world where they can, you know, a pharmaceutical company can spend thousands of dollars and put a bunch of trolls on you and troll all your articles and troll everything you do. And they do that to wear you down. They do that to suck up your energy and to make you just feel deflated. Reading things like that about yourself or you know how you look bad and you everything about you is wrong, it is deflating. So you have to, so you have to develop a really tough skin and you have to not feed the trolls. You know, I think you probably know this. You just do not feed the trolls. You just block them all. They're they're you know you they're not real people. Even if they're real people, they they they're out there to destroy your sense of self. And you have to have your home team who's going to support you, people who are going to come out in your defense. Um, and you just and you have to realize they're doing this not just to get you, but to put you up as an example to other people because they want to show what will happen if you challenge, if you become a challenger in a serious way of the status quo or some institution or some any invested interest, they want to show to other people, do not do what this woman did, do not do what this man did because we will end up punishing you in the same way. So you're an example. Um, you know, you and, have to And it's good to recognize that. Doing. What? It's good to recognize that it's this is happening. So it so right? it sounds to me like it's it's not about you. It it, it right? It's, it's not, not about really, it's not Nina about you. and it's not about Sandy. It's it's about something much, much bigger. And I think that's it what they want you. They want to right. right. And you know, and they want to separate you out and isolate you. You know, it's they want to make it seem like it's not the it's not the issue, it's not the problem here. The problem is Nina, or the problem is this person who is objecting. They'll try to isolate you, make you seem like the problem. They'll try to find the tiniest flaw in what you've done, and they'll try to deflect attention away from the larger issue to your tiny flaw, like your one little fact you got wrong. It is true that if you are going up against, if you're the challenger, you have to be extra careful. It is not a level playing field. You have to be extra careful in your facts. You have to be, you know, triple check everything because if they find anything wrong with what you've done. They will, um, they'll just focus on that. And, yeah. you know, and they, ha if you're going up against big pharma or big food or big whatever that you're challenging, they really do have the money and the, and the communications firms and the skills to really go after you. Um, so, and they will mess your Google rankings and they will mess up your Wikipedia profile and they'll, they'll do whatever they can. And so but they'll um, try, they'll try. And, and right. And sometimes they'll be successful. So, I mean, I think that it's just so important to remember why you're doing something like, why do you, I mean, what do, what am I motivated by? I am motivated. I was motivated principally when I started by this idea of truth. Like it was unbelievable to me that truth could be buried and unknown like that, or that people that good, that scientists could bury the truth. That, and then it became apparent to me as I got thousands and thousands of emails, of people saying, oh, I read your book. And then I, you know, it saved my life or I lost 50 pounds or 100 pounds or I reversed my heart disease and I reversed my diabetes or I didn't have to get my foot amputated or you know all these stories I got from people and then and then my mission or my sense of purpose really became more fueled by this very strong feeling that this information is so important for people to know that it's it's really almost a crime to withhold it from people I agree I I totally agree is there, is there any other um, final word of encouragement you'd like to give to our listeners today? Yes, I mean, I think that, well, having a life that, that feels purposeful is, um, it's, is, it just infuses your life with a kind of meaning that is maybe not obtainable in a lot of other ways. I mean, certainly families and love and 
and for many people religion or but I think that doing something for the public good, doing something in the name of truth, especially at a time when we live, you know, with a lot of confusion about what is fact and what is real, but committing yourself to something that you feel is a higher and better good and making the world a better place. Um, it really sounds corny, but, <laughs> but it really is a worthwhile devotion. Well, Nina, I, like I think you did make the world a better place. You certainly changed the world. Um, because I understand uh, these, this is uh, international, a lot of these studies are internationally done. Um, there's no doubt in my mind. Um, thank you so much for being here. Nina Techholz, who wrote the big fat, Techholz. Techholz. T-E-I-C-H-O-L-Z, who author Perfect. of The Big Fat Surprise. And thank you so much for joining me. And I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you can beat the big guys. Thank you for having me. Okay, just stay, stay. I'm just going to stop recording. Give me one second. I wish they made these buttons bigger.